Very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you follow us. Buenos días para los que nos seguís del otro lado del mundo. Eid Mubarak for the colleagues in, in the Middle East, I've seen already in the chat. So very welcome to this uh, new edition of the UNWTO Insight series. Um, the series aims to bring uh, the different partners with whom UNWTO works in data, insights and research to share um, in this difficult moment where data and analytics has become more and more relevant, what is data showing us in terms of trends, uh, recovery opportunities, uh, and also how we can use data to better prepare ourselves uh, for the current situation and hopefully to support the recovery of the tourism industry. From the UNWTO side, this is always um, a priority for us, as you know, we always want to make sure that our member state and the industry has the most updated and more relevant information, and also that we foster uh, collaboration between public and private sector in data management and in the use of data for better planning and decision making. So with that said, um, my name is Sandra Carvao. I'm in charge of the area of market intelligence and competitiveness at UNWTO. I'm very pleased to have with me today, Thomas Emmanuel. He's a director at STR, one of the UNWTO partners. Uh, and we will be taking you through um, two presentations. And after that, we'll be more than happy to hear your comments, your questions, and also any doubts you might have on data or other uh, trends that you might want to share with us as well. Uh, we have with us in um, the Zoom channel um, some of our member states, so very nice to have you around. Uh, you can then, after the presentation, share your questions in the Q&A um, box down. I'm, I'm sure that by now we are more than familiar with all this expressions and, and, and placements. Uh, also, for the ones following us on YouTube, um, we will be able to uh, answer your questions and, and uh, have them uh, featured in the discussion. So with that said, I'd like to, to start by sharing the latest UNWTO data which uh, probably you have not been even able to see yet. We just came out this morning and um, it's, um, it's something that, as we generally say, is hot out of the press. Um, UNWTO has just published this morning, I would say an hour ago, um, the latest uh, results from our UNWTO World Tourism Barometer where we follow um, since the beginning of the crisis on a uh, bi-monthly um, series of data from member states, from all the countries around the world in terms of how the pandemic is impacting tourism, but also to identify where we can see some signs of recovery. So with that said, um, I would just like to start by obviously, unfortunately, putting us a little bit into context. Uh, we all know, and I'm not going to repeat how the year of uh, 2020 has been unprecedented, but I'd just like to, to, to put this in, in the context because it's important to know what's our starting point and how have we kicked off 2021, because we will be looking mostly at the behavior naturally of uh, tourism in this year. Uh, last year, we lost around 73% of all international tourism. Uh, this means we were back and we are still back in levels of 30 years ago. So this is probably the most challenging situation we've ever lived. And it means that the market that is out there is much, much smaller. And obviously it is more and more important to understand it so that we can um, foster recovery. We've also lost um, a significant amount in terms of exports naturally. Um, as you know, tourism is one of the key elements of the balance of payments for many countries. But globally, just to give you an idea, over 40% of all the losses of um, the, the, the exports in 2020 were due to tourism. So you can imagine how that affected the balance of payments of countries. If we go a little bit into where we are now, and this is the data that was just released this morning by UNWTO, our data from January to May shows that compared to last year, we're at minus 65%. Um, but obviously it's very important to note that uh, last year we had still two strong months, January and, and February. And obviously we had a totally standstill of tourism uh, from mostly of March onwards. The most important thing when we look at obviously the market is where we are compared to the pre 
uh, pandemic levels. And unfortunately, recovery is being very uneven and very fragile, as we all know, due to the new variants, but also to the consequent imposing of travel restrictions in many countries. So we're basically currently uh, up to May in the first five months of 2021, we're still 85% down as compared to the base year of 2019. The diverse situation per regions is obviously marked by the fact that Asia Pacific continues to be a region where most countries are fully closed. So the international tourist movement is almost 100% down, as you can see in the graph. Uh, we have other regions as Europe also very much affected, minus 85%. Um, America's a little bit less, minus 72%. Um, we actually are seeing that some destinations in the Americas are the ones that have been um, recovering um, in, in the last months uh, in a more um, clear way. Uh, also in Africa, we're at minus 81 and in the Middle East around the same 83%. It's interesting to see as well, if you look at the data compared to 2020, that Europe is uh, together with the Americas slightly better. And this is um, as a consequence of the openings that we are starting to see in both parts of the world. Uh, looking ahead, uh, what can we expect towards the end of 2021? Um, UNWTO scenarios are based on uh, the principles of um, a reopening of borders and a rebound um, in, in travel. Uh, that we have put in two specific moments, because those are for us important moments also in terms of volume. Um, if we see that happening in July, and unfortunately, uh, the gradual opening has been very gradual, um, mostly in Europe, we're still seeing uh, the other parts of the world very much closed. Um, or in September, uh, but in any of the cases, we do expect that 2021 will still be uh, between minus 63 and minus 75 as we close the year compared to 2019. So we've also asked um, in, in our current um, ongoing surveys to our panel of experts that we have run now in October, January, and May, when do they see a rebound in their country? Um, and focusing specifically on international tourism, we know that in many countries, domestic has been doing fairly well. Um, and probably this is something we will see also in the data that STR will, will share with us. Um, but we wanted to know when do countries expect a rebound specifically of international tourism. And unfortunately, I think we've all gone through the fact that um, as new challenges emerge, that recovery is now seen later and later. And as you can see, around 60% of the survey members um, already indicated uh, in May that they would only see that happening next year. By regions as well, it's interesting to see that the Middle East is much more uh, optimistic. So I think there are signs of optimism in the Middle East, which indicate that the rebound in the, in the region could come later still this year. Um, then we do see obviously that regions such as Africa, Americas and Asia Pacific are a little bit less optimistic. And actually the region where we see um, a more uh, optimistic in terms of time as well, is Europe and um, that has to do with mostly um, the opening up within the Schengen area, which we have witnessed. Um, if we look a little bit further, uh, this is actually the scenarios that we have drawn um, very early uh, in the crisis and we have updated them at the end of last year. And unfortunately, I'd like to say that they have changed significantly. But I think um, the, the facts on the ground do not allow us to, to do that. Um, and we do still expect that uh, we might take two and a half years to three years uh, to four years, apologies, to actually go back to the previous uh, pre-pandemic uh, levels of demand, which obviously um, imposes immense challenges into the industry. We have asked the same question actually to our panel. When do they see the return to pre-pandemic levels in their countries and um, very much in line with what we have seen, um, the majority now expects it to be in 2023, 2024, or even later. You can see that almost 50% of the surveyed um, panel of experts considers that 
the return to pre-pandemic levels will not happen be before 2024. The same um, happening region-wise, as you can see, Middle East much more um, robustly thinking about uh, the recovery of uh, pre-pandemic levels by 2022, then a little bit of a mix of 2023, 2022 here in Africa, and definitely Asia seeing recovery much later, um, and the Americas as well, which is interesting because we actually are seeing um, some good results coming out of some of the, the destinations in the Americas. We've also asked, and I think this is um, also common ground at this moment, what is the biggest challenges that we face currently, apart from the slow virus containment? Um, definitely travel restrictions are the main factor still as um, hampering the return to normal travel patterns, but also um, the lack of coordination in terms of response. Also very interesting because um, in the early pandemic moments, the economic environment was one of the factors that was considered relevant, but it has lost importance um, as we uh, advanced. And now if you look at the survey that we did in May, only 20% actually indicated as an important factor as compared to others. So it's very much really the externalities of uh, the conditions to travel that are restraining demand. The same thing by region, um, definitely travel restrictions as the most important factor, uh, the containment of the virus, and um, as you can see, the economic environment, uh, specifically in, in some of the regions, very uh, small in importance, but even if you look at the Middle East, it's not even considered. So definitely we know that um, the desire to travel is there. The economic constraints are not significant uh, considering the, the responses that we got, but really it's about how can we recover movement in terms of requirements to travel. So looking into the world as it is today in terms of um, global uh, travel restrictions. Um, this is the latest results from the UNWTO COVID related travel restrictions report. It's a monitoring that's done by our colleagues um, on a regular basis. And today still we have 29% of the destinations worldwide, which are completely closed. Um, and most importantly, half of them have not even opened since May last year. So obviously this is one of the issues that we currently face. Um, just to give you an idea, this is information that you will have available at the UNWTO website um, in the UNWTO data dashboards. So for those interested, you just need to Google it, UNWTO data dashboards. And on the UNWTO tourism recovery tracker, you will find an area dedicated to uh, travel restrictions where you can see how these have evolved um, over the months in the last year. And this is the situation we had in February. Um, as you can see, um, significant amount of um, complete closures or partial closures, um, which has somehow improved in the last um, analysis, which is from June, which gives us uh, hope also as the vaccination rollout advances in many regions of the world. Um, actually, the report has uh, made a clear point, and we have seen that specifically in Europe uh, and in other uh, areas of the world, that the vaccination rollout and also the adoption of digital solutions have been key in actually facilitating and uh, travel, and we see that on the data, and also that those two factors will be the ones definitely determining how we will see a rise in the international mobility flows over the next um, months. Uh, just to finalize, I'd like to share with you some of the data tools that UNWTO has available. For those interested, again, in our website, they are all under the UNWTO data dashboards area. And you can find there, um, first of all, our UNWTO tourism recovery tracker, which gives an overview. Sorry, it's going to open now. <laughs> That's the thing with links. Um, it can give you an overview of significant KPIs which are relevant for our industry. Um, you'll find information by regions and subregions of issues such as uh, tourist arrival, seat capacity, both domestic and international, actual air reservation uh, trends, 
occupancy rates that we are very pleased to count on the collaboration of the STR here today with us. We also have information on the level of hotel searches and hotel bookings. So you can also see by region and compare your region with others. Um, we have added uh, this week two new indicators. One of them is the level of searches for flights and for accommodation um, in Google. So also to see if people um, desire to travel is there. And finally, we also have uh, information on travel sentiment, if uh, the conversations going on online regarding travel in terms of sentiment are changing. So as you can see, this is the, the world indicators um, um, screenshot. And I, I do invite you to explore further and, and uh, learn a little bit more about the indicators, but also um, in your region. We also have, I forgot to mention that, which is also an interesting point, the data from um, short-term rentals, which actually shows us uh, interesting trends into, into that area of demand. Another uh, dashboard that's available for the ones who want to compare their destination with others um, is uh, all the data that the countries report in terms of arrivals that is available in the UNWT World Tourism Barometer is also available in our dashboard. So you can actually consult the data monthly by destination and by region. And um, just to give you an idea, again, this is available uh, in the same space. Finally, um, I also would like to share uh, one tool that we have, which is um, regarding the travel restrictions and everything that has to do with um, requirements to travel. Uh, UNWTO has worked with IATA. This is um, one space where you can find on one side information related to what are destinations requiring travels to present? Um, so you can see the level of openness of the destination. Um, I invite all of the colleagues from the member states who are here to check their information because obviously keeping updated information for 200 countries around the world is a big challenge. So we do invite you to check your country, make sure that the information there is updated. We try our best with our um, colleagues in the different areas to make sure that this information is correct. But any information that you see that does not reflect the current status, please do contact us at UNWTO. Um, I'd just like to highlight that this is very important insight because it does allow you to see compared to your competitors, uh, what is happening as well. Um, this is the information that if you're boarding an airline, the airline will ask you. So this is where all airlines have their information from IATA when they ask you your test, your, your PCR and all of your details. So it's, it's a very good way to see how um, the travel restrictions are evolving. And again, we also have different indicators related to health um, and to regulations on the ground. So if the country has restrictions on travel movement inside the country, for example, if there's restrictions on um, operation of food and beverage and other elements which are relevant for tourism. Finally, also for those interested more on a policy level, UNWTO has created a space where the measures that countries have taken to support tourism are available. And again, um, I'd like to, to leave you with this uh, also to, to have information on specific support measures by country. This is, for example, the information on the domestic tourism campaign developed by France. But as you can see, you can find information on monetary policy, fiscal support to countries, um, issues of domestic tourism. And for those who are interested or developing their own policies, it can be a very um, useful benchmark tool. So with that, this is what I would like to share with you today. As I said, um, we'll be more than happy to hear your comments and questions by the end of the presentation. And uh, we will now uh, go from a more global perspective on tourism into specifically um, how is the hospitality industry um, performing and also where are we seeing some green shoots, which we, we would like to highlight um, and also, again, any questions, any comments, we'll be happy to take them at the end of the session. I'd like to welcome Thomas Emmanuel uh, once again. Uh, really good to have you with us and thank you for joining UNWTO on this UNWTO Insight series. And Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just gonna share my screen, hopefully 
you can all see that now in full screen mode. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us in the world. My name is Thomas Emmanuel. I'm a director at STR, and I'll be taking you through a, a presentation on global hotel performance. So we've got a lot to cover, but we'll start off with a global overview, comparing how the various regions are performing. And then we'll drill down into each region in turn, Europe, Asia Pacific, the Middle East and Africa, and finally the Americas. So let's begin our journey with, with first of all, a global overview. And this first chart showcases occupancy June year to date by global region using two separate methodologies. The first of which is the standard methodology, which showcases only those hotels that are open. And then you've got total room inventory methodology, which takes into account all properties, regardless of whether they're open or not. And what we've really got here is a two tier recovery based on the region that you're in. You'll see there North America, mainland China, the Middle East and Australasia are certainly ahead of the other regions, whereas Latin America, Africa, Asia, excluding China and here in Europe, where I'm based, are certainly lagging behind. And that two tier recovery will become ever more apparent as we move through the presentation. But moving on from occupancy to look at average daily rate, and this is ADR indexed to 2019. And again, we see some differentials. So some regions are actually quite near the levels that hotels were charging back in 2019. We see that again in Australasia, in China, in Southern Africa, in Central America, their rates are really pretty much back to where they were prior to the pandemic. Others still playing catch up in terms of gaining back that average rate. And you can see once again, Europe remains the laggard. And if we combine those two metrics, we get RevPAR, of course, revenue per available room. And again, this is indexed to 2019. And the two tier recovery, again, very apparent, highest in China, lowest in Europe. So we will see that play out more and more as we run through the various regions again. But let's now have a, a longer term look at occupancy, again indexed to 2019 for those regions. And we can see going back to when the pandemic started, of course, Asia Pacific fell first, which was representative of the fact that the pandemic began in China. But subsequent to that, we saw all other regions fall very quickly, sharply in tandem with one another. But those regions that fell furthest, so we can see that in Europe, in Africa, in Central South America, fell further and have as we saw previously, not recovered quite so far, whereas the Middle East and North America getting far closer to the pre-pandemic peak. If we look at that from a rate perspective, again, what we can see here is that average rates didn't fall anywhere near as far as occupancy did, which of course is a positive for hoteliers. And again, there's a bit of a two-tier situation. We've got Latin America, the Middle East, and Europe with a bit more ground to make up whereas Africa, Central South America, and North America are pretty much back to those pre-pandemic peaks once again. And if we then look at the key cities across the globe, you can see once again that regional differentiation quite clear, far lower occupancies across Europe, Africa, and Latin America. There are some bright spots, as you can see, Singapore, Miami, Auckland, for example, but all of those cities still performing far below the levels we would see in a quote unquote normal year. So a great deal of difference between regions across the world. But now let's drill down at each one in turn. And we're going to start where I'm based here in Europe. And this first chart showcases, again, occupancy indexed to 2019 for some key European markets. And again, if we go back to last year, we see Italy fall a little bit faster as as COVID hit in that country before the rest of Europe. And again, the other countries falling in unison, a bit of a peak for last summer, things tailing off again as the second wave hit. But where we find ourselves today, really two countries have been standing out for most of 2021, those being Russia and Turkey, both having very strong domestic demand bases, which has certainly aided occupancy and some lesser restrictions in place as well. The UK in the light blue there as well, coming back and doing relatively well in comparison to many others. 
the government's roadmap here in the UK has certainly helped that firm dates where people could plan towards hotels could plan for reopening has benefited performance. And then you can see as well, a bit of recovery in Poland. But elsewhere, generally across Western Europe anyway, countries' occupancies are hovering at around the 40% level of where they were in 2019. And if we look at some of our key cities across the continent as well, we've got a very clear pattern here. You've got 2019, which as I mentioned, quote unquote, a normal year. Then we see 2020, but we must remember, as Sandra said, the first two, two and a half months of 2020 were relatively normal. And then we've got that further decline for 2021, where things have been, of course, very difficult throughout. The one exception being Moscow, you can see there, for the, for the reasons I mentioned previously relating to Russia. And then if we do the same, but for average rates, again, we see that clear decline year upon year. But of course, we didn't see the declines anywhere near as severe from a rate perspective as we have from an occupancy perspective. But now I want to move on to forward looking data, business on the books. And I'm going to go back a couple of months, first of all, to the beginning of May. And this was the occupancy on the books by country for the next 14 days and then the pickup week upon week. And you can see it was pretty low across the board, as you'd expect. If we fast forward a month to June, we can see things are picking up a little bit more, led by the UK and Ireland. And then if we fast forward to July, so looking at data from last week, we can again see things across the board have improved, being led again by the UK, Ireland and Spain. So things are starting to look a little bit better, those green shoots that were mentioned previously. So let's have a look at Ireland, uh, the UK, sorry, and Spain in a bit more detail there. Now, this is London and regional UK, which is the whole country excluding the capital. And this shows business on the books last week for the next 90 days. And I think what you can get from this is three key takeaway facts. The first one is the booking window remains quite short. People are not planning in advance at the moment. They're booking relatively late in the day for their upcoming stays. Secondly, regional markets are performing better than large cities. And you can see that quite clearly in this divide here. And that is a theme that we see repeated again and again across the world. And then thirdly, those peaks that you see throughout this chart are all for weekends. So that just once again underlies that the recovery at the moment is driven by weekend predominantly, but leisure demand. Domestic weekend leisure demand is key at present. And we can see that leisure demand very clearly in this next chart, which showcases the top occupancy performers in the UK at present. And from the moment that hotels could reopen in May, you can see occupancies have been relatively strong. And as of last week, they were all above 80% for these regional markets, which of course are dominated by leisure demand. And this is before the school holidays start in the UK. So again, we can expect to see a bit of a boost throughout the end of July and August. So possibly a decent summer ahead. And similar circumstances very much taking place in Spain as well. You can see there the Canaries and the Balearics performing better in terms of business on the books than we see in either Madrid or Barcelona. Although Barcelona does seem to be benefiting from some leisure summer demand as you'd expect to see in that city anyway. But if we look at recovery, and we look at the STR forecast, we're forecasting that in Europe, demand, so that's rooms sold, will surpass 2019 levels in 2024, and then ADR, average daily rate, and rev par, revenue per available room, in 2025. So just as Sandra said, when looking at the UNWTO forecasts, STR are coming out at things from a similar length of time related to the recovery. And if we drill down and look at some key cities here, Again, we see some differences. So Moscow, we forecast will surpass 2019 levels in 2023. London, Paris, Berlin a year later, Amsterdam in 2025, but then Madrid and Warsaw, well, we don't believe they will be back at their prior peaks until beyond 2025. So it's gonna be a long road ahead. But let's now move on and have a look at Asia Pacific. Let's move to the East and this is a very busy chart, but I think also a very beneficial one with a lot of key findings. And if we just 
take a, a handful of these countries and, and look at the occupancy since the beginning of last year indexed to 2019, we see there Singapore in yellow. It's done relatively well, but a lot of that demand has come from quarantine business for people arriving on the island. You can see there as well, China obviously falling first, but has recovered really quite strongly. And you'll see on the next couple of slides just how strongly China is starting to get back. Australia and New Zealand have generally held up fairly well. We know they have pretty much closed their borders, but ultimately that domestic demand has led to a much better performance along with a lack of lockdowns that we've seen there. Although the recent Australian lockdowns, you can see a bit of a decline. And then similarly in Indonesia, a country that has widely kept things open, kept things moving. With the arrival of the Delta variant, the government has now imposed restrictions and we can see the decline in performance happening quite sharply. India started to pick back up a little bit, obviously after a very difficult period as we know. And then Japan with its additional waves, things falling right on the eve of the Olympics. So again, we'll be looking closely to see how the limited visitation for the games do impact performance. And then at the bottom, you'll see Thailand and Vietnam, both obviously attractive tourism destinations which have effectively been closed, but are starting to reopen. And we'll see in a moment the impact of the reopening on Phuket. But if we move to look at China in a bit more detail, now I mentioned, and you've seen on previous charts, just how well they have recovered. And this really does showcase this, as you can see at the top end of the market, back up above 2019 levels, pretty much there for upscale and upper mid-scale. And then at the bottom end of the market, there or thereabouts, a little bit further away, but ultimately recovering very strongly. And the same there from an average rate perspective. Conversely, a little bit more recovery, closer to 2019 levels in the mid-scale and economy, but ultimately with a wealth of domestic demand from leisure, from corporate, because that's back in China, as well as group mice business, China is looking relatively good. Now, I mentioned Thailand earlier, and we just saw the reopening of the so-called Phuket sandbox at the beginning of this month. And we've seen very, very slowly as those tourists start to trickle back, obviously occupancies are low, there's no doubting that, but things are starting to move in the right direction. So hopefully with more tourists allowed in, we'll see Phuket recover, but also all those other magnificent Thai resorts as well going forward. Moving down under now and looking at Australia and New Zealand, we can again see for the most part when you compare to 2019, these markets have held up relatively well, particularly Darwin, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane. But you can see now the impact of the lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria, in South Australia as well. So there is a bit of a challenge there at the moment. And of course, both of these markets very reliant on international visits, on tourism. So until that fully reopens, we will see hotels continuing to struggle to get back to those prior peak levels. But if we look at business that's currently on the books down under, we can again see a bit of a mixed picture. Darwin looks strong, Wellington looks strong, but you can see very clearly the impact of the prolonged lockdown on Sydney and the performance business on the books in that market. So if again, we look further into the future with our forecasts, we see actually a rather sobering picture. Sydney, Auckland, Bangkok, Mumbai, we don't forecast any of those cities will have recovered to their pre-pandemic peaks by 2025. We believe Tokyo will get there that year, but look at Beijing, recovered by 2023, surpassing 2019 levels, really just underlying the strength of the Chinese recovery. Let's now have a look at the Middle East and Africa. And again, a very busy chart to begin with, but an important one. And I think what we see here is those GCC nations, Qatar, Saudi, the Emirates, all doing relatively well in comparison to many others. In Africa, we've got countries that are driven by what we can call essential corporate travel. So I'm thinking about the oil sector here or diplomatic sector are holding up a little bit better. Whereas those are a little bit more reliant on tourism, of course, such as Kenya or South Africa, which has obviously had a very difficult few weeks are struggling far more. As you can see, South Africa at less than 20% of its 2019 levels currently. 
And if we look at some of those key Middle Eastern markets, you can see some of them are actually performing really quite well when compared to 2019. Doha, pretty much back to peak, but a lot of the demand there is driven by quarantine business. Riyadh and Jeddah are also doing relatively well, strong Saudi domestic demand, some leisure business as well for Jeddah, obviously, with it being on the coast. And then Dubai and Abu Dhabi, both doing relatively well. Good start to the year in both of those markets. We saw a lot of influencers in those markets at the beginning of the year when we were all freezing here in Europe. They were enjoying the sunshine. And we're starting to see Russian visitors return to the Emirates, Eastern European visitors as well. And a lot of long stay guests as well across Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So it was not surprising to me to see Middle East being a little more bullish about the recovery. And if we look at Dubai, which is obviously the main, the biggest hotel market in the region, you can see there occupancy still trailing behind 2021. But in the last six weeks or so, it's not too far behind. And you can clearly see the shift for Ram Ramadan, which was earlier this year than in 2019 as well. And of course, all eyes should be on Dubai later this year for the World Expo, which is starting in October. And we are starting to see slowly, slowly, some business on the books starting to build up across Dubai. The Middle East is notoriously has short booking windows. So hopefully we'll see this increase substantially as we get towards what I'm sure will be an absolutely fantastic exhibition. And then in terms of recovery, well, again, a long road ahead, 2024 in Dubai, 25 in Abu Dhabi for Revpar surpassing 2019. I just want to touch on Africa as well briefly. And what we've got here again is a wide difference in performance. This is Revpar. And you can see actually Lagos doing relatively well in comparison, driven by, of course, oil demand, similar situation for Accra. And then dip diplomacy, the diplomatic heart of Africa, Addis Ababa, also holding up relatively well in comparison. I was surprised when I put this together to see Sharm El Sheikh doing quite so well. But again, Russian visitors helping to boost that market. But elsewhere, you can see still a lot of African cities really struggling to build up. And I think for Africa, there are a few reasons why. There's obviously a lack of domestic demand across many of these countries, despite disposable income growing and, and the African middle class growing as well. They're also fly to destinations. They're not drive to destinations. They're not as accessible. And obviously there has been a huge upheaval in the airlift into Africa as, as it has been around the world. So some challenges and, and Mauritius you can see there at the very bottom has had a really weak start to the year, but they've started to let in tourists now. So hopefully we'll see performance start to pick up there very shortly. And then the last of the four regions I want to cover is, is, of course, the Americas. And again, it's a very mixed picture. The US doing relatively well, and we'll come on to that in a moment. Canada started to pick up Mexico as well, driven by a lot of US travelers now holidaying there. But the further south you get in the Americas, the more challenging the situation is, certainly. And you can see there at the bottom, Argentina, a country which relies a lot on international visitation and on group business, really struggling, pretty much borders being closed and also restrictions between provinces as well, making things very, very tough for hoteliers there. But let's now have a quick look at the states. And we can see this is May year to date, but June was, was decent in the US, well over 50% occupancy year to date. Now ADR is getting back up to peak. Things are looking better in the States than in most markets, of course, driven by a lot of domestic demand. But we are still seeing a larger gap in terms of recovery to 2019 at the top end of the market than we are at the bottom. And this has been a pattern that we've seen across the world since the start of the pandemic. The higher the class of hotel, the greater the impact that the pandemic has had on its performance. But one real bright spot for the US is that transient demand is now back and surpassing 2019 levels, which is really very, very positive. But where the US is missing is group business. And you can see it's nowhere near the 2019 levels. And we believe group demand is going to be the last to recover. And I'll come on to that momentarily as well. 
In terms of big cities, well, 19 of the top 25 markets, over 50 percent. And you can see, again, leisure markets, Tampa, Miami, Virginia Beach, doing that much better. Those more reliant on corporate or international demand, San Francisco or Minneapolis or Orlando or New York, more challenged. Not surprising to see. And then looking to the future, demand, we believe, will be back in 2023 in the US, which is sooner than the other regions that we've mentioned. ADR not quite there and need the rev part, but a potentially a slightly shorter recovery window for the states. Looking at the Caribbean, well, this looks mixed, RevPAR percentage change, but actually I take a lot of positives from this slide because if you think again, the first two, two and a half months of the year were relatively normal in 2020, to see these increases in Puerto Rico, in Cancun, in the Dominican Republic, actually really very positive. And sticking with Cancun or the Mexican Caribbean, it's open for business, 70% business on the books up until the middle of August, which is fantastic to see. And again, in Mexico, we see a great divide between the resorts, between Cancun, Cabo St. Lucas, and then cities such as Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey, et cetera. It is once again, very much a leisure driven recovery. And then lastly, South America, a bit more challenged as we know. Lima has had a better pandemic, can we say, than other markets. Again, a lot of that quarantine business as miners came into the country to work. We're seeing Brazil start to, to move a little bit, but again, very much leisure driven. And then Montevideo and Santiago, a little bit better, strong vaccination programs in Uruguay and Chile helping, but again, very much domestic. And you can see once again at the bottom there, Buenos Aires for the reasons I mentioned previously. So to allow me to just conclude, what do hotels need to see their demand recover? And I think this is an excellent chart because it's, it shows you what we believe at STR needs to happen to see different demand sectors return. So hotels are reopened. So we've seen that domestic leisure return. Once the borders open, we'll see more short haul leisure. Sandra talked about the Schengen zone. That's one example. US to Mexico is another example. Borders need to be open and we'll start to see short haul leisure return. Where businesses have returned to the office, again, the US, China, we've seen far more domestic business travel, but we need to see more of that happening. And then the government restrictions, wider spread vaccinations for longer, longer haul international business and leisure. And then last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, group business will take longer to come back, we believe. But we also did a survey with our traveler panel. And similarly to what Sandra mentioned in the UNWTO's survey, the biggest barriers are government related. So there are others on this charts, of course, related to health, related to experience, potential financial implications as well. But ultimately the fact that it is government restrictions, which are the biggest barriers to travel, I think is a good news story for our industry because it shows people want to get back out there. They just can't at the moment. So to, to summarize in, in three, three points, certainty will equate to bookings. Once we have some certainty, once people believe they will be able to travel hassle-free and have a good experience, those bookings will return. But for now, certainly for 2021, good portion of 22 as well, I think domestic demand is gonna be key. But let's end on a positive. Hospitality has always, and it will bounce back. People want to travel, they want to experience, they want to meet. And as a result, our fantastic industry will get back there. It will take time, but we will get back and we will be stronger than ever when that happens. So I hope that was of use. I'll say thank you very much. Of course, don't hesitate to contact me if you've got any questions about anything I've covered. And I'll say thank you again and hand back to Sandra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I think that was a um, very uh, in-depth presentation about the different um, performances and also I think the, the, the importance of the on-the-book information to see where we're heading. Um, it's interesting to see that some destinations which we might not expect are actually doing fairly well, which is uh, a sign of hope and also obviously um, how we see leisure and um, in business travel recovering in, in different moments. Um, I also wanted to reiterate for the colleagues who are with us and have specific questions 
um, both on YouTube and um, here through Zoom. You have the question and answer um, chat down if you want to. Um, we have um, a little bit of a question which is more specific from one of our um, followers in YouTube uh, from India which we, we appreciate. Um, and the question uh, relates to a very specific state in India, uh, which I think probably Thomas will not have information at that detailed level. Um, I do think we, we did see some, some cities, which gives us a little bit of an idea, um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we will not be able to, to give you information at the level of state in, in India, um, because the, the data probably is not available for that. Thomas, I'd just like you to, to confirm. <laughs> Yeah, not, not at my fingertips, but um, whoever's asked that question, please do reach out to me directly. Um, we do have a great coverage in India. We've got a great team on the ground in Mumbai, and I'm sure we'll be able to give you some insights as to how we're seeing the different levels of recovery across various states and cities uh, across India. Perfect. So the, 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 the contact of, of Thomas was in his last slide, and I'll just ask my colleagues who are in, the, in, in, in making this possible with us to maybe share it if Thomas is in agreement. Um, in, uh, in the, at the end, we will remind them again. Um, we also have um, another question, um, and it comes from YouTube as well, so I'll share it with, with the audience here. And uh, for Thomas, which is, uh, what is the hotel category that seems to be more popular? Is it the luxury segment providing to be more resilient uh, besides Asia and the Pacific? So it's a, it, that's a very good question, because throughout the pandemic, what we saw predominantly was actually mid-scale and economy hotels. So the, the lower classes were performing better. And I think that was to be expected because at the time, anyway, travel hotel uh, stays outside the home were pretty much for essential purposes only. So it was, it, it was far more likely that you were going to stay at, at, a, at a cheaper um, accommodation. I think what we've seen is a slightly faster recovery at the lower end of the market. We've seen them come back a little bit more. Of course, the leisure traveler is genuinely more price sensitive than the corporate traveler. And I think that's having an impact on things as well. Um, what we did see, though, with luxury hotels, the, the top end have not have not discounted the, the discounted their rates as significantly as we've seen in the other classes. So potentially we'll see a faster recovery from a rate perspective. So it's really been a, a bit of a mixed bag, but now I, th I think still for the, for the luxury and the upper upscale properties, the lack of group business and the lack of corporate demand is still gonna be a bit of a challenge. Whereas those more price or less price sensitive, uh, sorry, more price sensitive leisure travelers are going to be more likely to be staying uh, at the lower end of the market. And, th and that will probably drive a, a faster recovery, I think, in those sectors. Thank you, Thomas, for that insight. Um, I don't know, uh, again, if any other questions um, that you'd like to, to address us um, through the YouTube channel or um, the, the Zoom here in, in question and answer chat. Um, I think one of the questions that probably pops into my mind is we've, we've We've seen some of the destinations, and particularly, I was surprised with some of the cities doing really well. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> we have seen that obviously um, urban tourism has been a more among the more affected. I don't know if um, if you also see that in terms of the location of the of the properties. Um, if you can maybe just talk us a little bit through that. So I think it, it we are seeing some cities doing perhaps better than we would expect to. And I think there's an, obviously that the vast majority of that demand is still leisure driven. So yes, urban tourism is definitely um, impacting things. You know, I mean, I, I live to the South of London uh, in Surrey and in October last year, my wife and my children, we, we came into London and we had two nights in London and it was great. It was a change of scenery. We can't go abroad. And we could just get a train up and it was fantastic. And I think a lot of people are doing that kind of thing. They're, 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 they're taking advantage because they want a change of scenery. They want a change of the four walls that they've been stuck in for so long. So I think that that is driving it. And we are starting to see slowly, slowly some corporate demand coming back as well. It's mm -hmm. not non-existent, but it's, of course, predominantly domestic corporate mm -hmm. demand. But I still do think you can see very clearly in the in the, the UK slide that I presented, for example, when looking at those 
regional markets like Devon and Cornwall, like Norfolk, like the Lake District in the UK, for example, all doing very, very well, because that's where most people want to go at the moment. And you'll see that across the world as well in, you know, the Baltic coast, for example, in Germany is another perfect example of a market that's doing really very well, because again, people want that, that leisure time and, and, and the regional markets are more driven. But yeah, let's not, don't discount the cities because there is still certainly an attraction to them. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think it's also um, obviously the domestic market is, is going to continue to be in the short term, the, the biggest um, recovery potential, uh, as you mentioned, individual families um, and, and definitely um, proximity travel as well. Um, I think there's an opportunity to uh, innovate in products for the people who are uh, mm. more than domestic, very, very closely to the destinations. Um, and obviously we've seen how that has worked through the, the pandemic as well. Um, mm. Another thing that we're probably seeing and also you dealing with uh, with um, this information is um, the, the, the windows of bookings have been relatively um, shortened since the pandemic. Obviously the mm. and security of travel restrictions restrictions has impacted on that um, with all your contacts also and, and networking with the hospitality sector how do you see that uh, moving forward the, the booking windows as you said have been very short and I, I think that's understandable and I think we've got to think about sort of the psyche of the traveler at the moment and I remember going back to March of last year when I went home from the office with my laptop you know see you in a couple of weeks we didn't expect it to last any longer and then it lasted a bit longer and then they we were told our summer will be back and, and so on and so forth. So people have made plans and they've had to cancel those plans. And sometimes there's a financial benefit there. I think the industry has done very, very well in being flexible around cancellation fees. And I think that, you know, hats off to the industry at a very tough time that they're actually thinking about things in this regard. But I do think whilst there's still a level of uncertainty, people will be leaving things quite last minute because they're, they're concerned. We've seen... I'm, I, I'm in the UK and, and Portugal was on the green list, then it was on the amber list, you know, thing, and, and you see on the news, people are scrambling to get home before they have to quarantine. So there's a lot of, of, of reticence, I think. And until we get, I said at the end, certainty will equate to bookings. And I think that's so true. Um, and until we get more certainty and we feel more comfortable, th those booking windows, I think, are going to remain far shorter than we would have seen pre-pandemic. Perfect. Thank you so much. I don't think we have any more questions on this chat or the YouTube channel. Um, Thomas, before we close, I'd like just um, any last uh, message you'd, you'd like to leave us with um, from, from the data. Obviously, I think from our side at UNWT, we just want to reinforce the importance of really keeping an eye and um, to build systems of information within your destinations that allow you to actually follow up on this um, important information in a way that you are close to the market and you can act in a very agile way. Um, but mm. uh, you know, any last message you'd like to share with us as well in I terms think, of the data uh, I think before we close I just, today? I just echo that. You know, we're, we're in uh, hopefully a period of now sustained recovery. Obviously, there are a lot of the variants out there are, are, are changing all the time, but ultimately we should be on the path to recovery. So utilize the data that's out there. We know it's going to be a long, a long way back, but I do think it's it's important to stay positive. It's a fantastic industry. It's an industry people are incredibly passionate about the world over, and we will get back to where we were. It's just going to take time, but utilize the data out there to, to help make the decisions to make your destination more attractive or ultimately your business more money as well. Perfect, Thomas. We actually have a last minute question, okay. <laughs> which comes from Africa, which we'd just like to, before we do close, we have two minutes. So I'm going to take it um, in, in uh, as we close. And, and mm -hmm. the question refers to how do you see the African market recovery looking like across the different regions? And how do you see the vaccines uh, playing a role? And obviously, this is one of the challenges we face is the different paces of vaccination of course. In, in, around the world. And um, for us, this is also a very important point. Yeah, I think it's absolutely pivotal because there are going to be restrictions on people going to countries with low vaccination rates. So the rollout of vaccines the world over is, is pivotal. And I hope, um, you know, for those countries that have that have vaccinated most of 
their populations, they're going to be really proactive in supplying any excess to those countries that are, are not at the same level. I think it's, it's, it's a global pandemic, we have to fight it together. So I think that is a really, a, a really valuable point. I think in terms of Africa, it's going to be a, a tough recovery, if I'm honest with you. I, I touched on a few of those reason, re, reasons previously. The domestic demand, which is proving to be the catalyst in a lot of the world, is not there in, in many cases in Africa, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, which is going to be a challenge. And I think the, the air connectivity piece is absolutely vital. It, you, as I say, you know, you don't drive to Lagos, you don't drive to Addis Ababa. And it might sound facetious, but ultimately, if you're in London, or if you're in Paris or Munich or, or New York, you've got millions and millions of people who can get in a car and be there with, within a, f a few hours. So I think the airlift is going to be pivotal. I think the um, vaccination pace is going to be pivotal. Uh, and once that once that that returns, we, we saw actually Africa doing very well pre-pandemic in many cases. A lot of new supply coming in, the global hotel chains really buoyed by the opportunities that were in Africa. So th there's a bright future there undoubtedly, but we, we are going to have to overcome these hurdles. But I'm sure we'll get there, but again, it's it's going to take some time and potentially longer than we will see in 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 the West, effectively. Muted. So thank you so much, Thomas. I think that's a, that's an important point, and also um, from our side to to work further on the domestic market. I think this is also one of the lessons we all learned from the pandemic on how can we know better our domestic markets and adapt our products to, to the market as well. So with that said, we're um, one minute past our time. So very sharp on the, on the, on the dot. I want to thank, uh, first of all, Thomas for, for joining us today and, and sharing his data and his knowledge with us as we off to summer here in Europe and hopefully uh, also some return to travel in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, we'll continue to, to provide with all our capacity in terms of data and insights to our member states as we navigate through this challenging moment. Um, so once again, this webinar will be available on our, our YouTube platform as well for those who want to revisit the presentations and share it. So we will soon be posting them. And finally, I'd just like to uh, also uh, thank the team, uh, Tihana, Michelle and Anna who made this possible from the UNWTO uh, side and tell you that uh, we will be back in, uh, in another session on UNWTO Insights with more data and more market intelligence to support recovery. Thank you once again, and I hope that you, wherever you are, have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.